All right. Hi, Ranjani. Thanks for coming. Um, so everyone, welcome. Today we're going to talk about the National Parks of Washington. Um, to get us going, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and then for folks who are comfortable unmuting, I would just love to hear um, kind of where you're coming from and anything you're interested in hearing about, because I can certainly go um, deeper into specific stuff if people have questions. Um, and I just, just a quick confirm, I'm assuming everyone can hear me okay. Yes. Okay, okay. perfect. Awesome. Great. Um, so who am I? My name is Emily Grossniklaus. I moved here to Seattle, Washington in 2016. So I've been here for seven years. Um, and I am an avid outdoors person. I loved the outdoors before I came to Washington, but being here has just like completely opened my, my eyes. Um, and so I'm a very avid hiker, backpacker, camper, um, getting into biking and that kind of stuff too. Um, and so for that, from kind of that starting point, I've really done, I've probably done like over 50 hikes in Washington and probably like 30 or so in the national parks. Um, so that's what prompted me to kind of talk to you guys about that stuff today. Um, and yeah, that's my background. If someone's willing to kick us off, I would love to hear kind of where you're coming from and then anything you are interested in. So I know I have some resident experts in the room. Michelle is, um, I know from Washington too. So um, yeah, I'll just be curious to hear where you guys are coming from. I can kick us off. Hello everyone, my name is Ranjani. Um, I had the good fortune of going to college with Emily and I'm very excited for this presentation. Um, I currently hail in Washington, D.C. Um, I've done a fair amount of national park hiking, but I by no means I'm an expert. I think I'm interested in, you know, learning about like multi-day backpacking trips and um, some of the preparedness that comes with that. My main interest is sort of showing up outdoors in community and learning about um, how to bring more diversity and equity to uh, the great outdoors and I'll maybe I'll just popcorn it to someone um, yeah let's go to Steven <clears throat> hi Emily well um being from Ohio and I apologize I don't know why my camera doesn't want to work but it doesn't want to work today um three trips to the Washington area my first one in 62 to visit my fan uh, my aunt and uncle in uh, PL Washington I have a cousins who still live there. My wife and I were back and we did is what my cousin referred to. We did a seven day fly into Seattle, did the entire loop around the state. We did uh, Olympia, hiked Olympia. We were out at the rainforest. We were up at Forks. We came down the coastline. Um, we spent some time at Rainier up at, uh, and then back around. Um, so part of the reason I wanted to click in, because I usually click in with the Chicago group, was I was curious to see if any of the places we hike made your list. And then was out there uh, a number of years ago on an attempt to do Rainier with the company. So uh, along with some uh, family members who were uh, homesteaders way back in the day. Um, so very interested to see what's going on in Seattle and to see if our hikes that we did happen to make any of the ones that you're going to talk about. Awesome. Thank you so much. That sounds like an amazing trip. And I'm so impressed that you fit so much into like a whirlwind tour. Um, yeah, thanks so much for joining. I'll be curious too. I'll ask if, you know, as we go for folks, if there's anything that you did see when you came out and I missed, I would love to hear, um, hear things that are on your list too. Um, we can popcorn it to Maria. Hello, um, I'm also here in the Seattle area. I've been here for about four years and I've been uh, hiking pretty much every weekend since I got here. I've like started training for like longer hikes and I just wanna kind of hear more about like, are there any hidden gems or like swimming holes that, you know, like that are, maybe I haven't heard before. I usually try to like stick to the ones that I know, like Mount Sai or um, things that are like around the area, but but I just want to like start exploring and seeing other new things. Awesome. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, 
Yeah, I, I tried to put a diversity of hikes. And so I think hopefully some will be a little bit more off the beaten path. Um, so yeah, that's so exciting. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, I believe we have Sherry, if you're able to unmute. Sherry's iPhone. Um, we cannot hear you. If you want to share, that would be awesome. If not, totally okay. Yeah, I'd rather not share, but thank oh, okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. Um, and then Michelle, tell us a little bit about where you're coming from. Okay. Uh, <laughs> unmuting. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Michelle. I uh, also have had the privilege of knowing Emily since she moved here um, into the Seattle area in 2016. Um, I actually, I grew up just outside of Seattle, um, so a local, but I feel like I've mostly done a lot of, um, I think generally kind of like more, like more local hikes kind of along like the I-90 corridor, some a little bit further out. Um, in the North Cascades, but not as much. And so, yeah, just interested, I think, to learn more um, about, especially some of like the the national park highlights, because um, I actually feel like I haven't done that much hiking within the national parks themselves. So yeah, excited to be here. Okay, awesome. Thanks guys. Um, thanks for warming us up. So I'll get us going just to give us an overview. I think you guys probably all are pretty familiar with where the where the national parks are in Washington, but just to remind everyone, um, we I've I've identified Seattle as kind of the center part of the map. I recognize that as a little biased. There are a lot of wonderful places in Washington, um, but I just pointed that out because a lot of people will fly into and out of Seattle. Um, and then we have three major parks. So we have National uh, Mount Rainier National Park, which is about two or three hours from Seattle, and we also have the Olympics which is closer to three to four hours. Um, the key about the Olympics, which we'll get into, is that it's an amazing park, but you usually do have to take either a ferry to get over there, or you have to kind of drive around um, all the way down the sound and around and out to the peninsula. So it's a bit more of a trek. Um, and the ferries are, I think, wonderful and amazing. But just to, if you do end up wanting to go to the Olympics, they um, you do kind of have to calculate that additional time a little bit into your um, traveling. And then last but not least are the North Cascades. Um, I love the North Cascades so much and they're like three to four hours from Seattle. So the reason I point this out is um, I think some folks may not totally realize how far all these places are from each other. So to do um, kind of all three parks is a pretty big endeavor. Um, I would suggest if you're coming out for a week long trip, not to do more than two. Um, and I would really advocate for spending at least a couple of days in each park because there's so much to see and each park is just so wonderful that instead of spending a lot of drive time between all three, um, getting to stay in one or two, I think is a little bit wiser. Um, that's just my personal recommendation because I think um, the drive time can kind of add up. So I wanted to highlight that. Um, something else just to highlight is that um, I wanted to acknowledge that all of these parks do kind of um, have used native land. So just a little bit of a native land acknowledgement. Um, I was going to try to name all of the lands, like the tribals, um, tribal land that is used for each park, but um, each one has used at least like eight or nine tribes from their land. So just a lot of, um, just some background history there is that there's a lot of tribes that have been impacted by these parks. All right. Any questions on kind of location or anything like that before we jump on to some specifics? All right. So I'm going to start us out with Mount Rainier. I love Mount Rainier um, so much. I think it's like an incredibly beautiful place. Um, there are two visitor centers for Mount Rainier National Park, and I've I've highlighted the two. Um, so Sunrise is up here in the north side. It's the Sunrise Visitor Center. Can you guys see my little mouse when I am showing it like that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So um, Sunrise is up north and then Paradise is down south. Um, and the reason I'm highlighting these as having um, visitor centers is they, they both have, I know that Paradise has lodging. I think Sunrise has lodging as well. And then they definitely have like food. 
obviously the cafe's hours are kind of limited um, to in the summer and then during the day, but just so you know, they actually do have like some element of accommodation, i.e. you can get food and drink at each. Um, I think the caveat, of course, is that these are like where everyone flocks to. And so you can unfortunately get some pretty long wait times um, to get into the park themselves. Um, so just know in the summer, especially if you want to go to one of the two major visitor centers, so either Sunrise in the North or Paradise in the South, um, it could be like an hour long wait to just to get into the park, um, but the earlier you get there, the better. So I would say try to be there um, even before the park technically opens to reduce kind of the amount of wait time you have. The third region I'm going to talk about is up here in the northwest corner of the park. Um, this is the Moich Lake slash Carbon River entrance. Um, this does not have a visitor center. So just know if you end up going there, there's not going to be a lot of like accommodations. There's not any food or any water. Um, you have to bring all that stuff yourself. But I think it's kind of more of like a hidden gem location. Um, and I'll highlight some of the hikes that I've done there. The other nice thing about the Moich Lake entrance is that for the folks coming from Seattle, it's um, the closest entrance. And so it's like under two hours um, to get down there. So I kind of like it for that reason, too, is a little bit um, faster to get to. All right. The first one I'm going to talk to you guys about um, is the Paradise entrance. Um, this is kind of the jewel, the highlight. Like this is, if you come to one place in Mount Rainier, this is the place to go. Um, for Steven, did you, you might recognize this as probably the, the location of where you started your hike or climb for Rainier. Yeah, it is. Um, my wife had had her knee replaced in April. So when we were out, we, we were at the park in October, literally as they're boarding up the doors and taking the, you know, the information signs down. Um, so we, for our hike, we went up Dead Horse Canyon, went up along Skyline. Um, I really debated about leaving her at the sign and making a <laughs> run for, um, oh dear, just fell off the tip of my tongue. We were just talking about it because I was talking about this one. Um, but anyway, and then came back, came back down around Skyline uh, and just had a, a wonderful experience. It was li literally just us there. Of course, we were also there at, at probably the least touristy time before the snow get, really got bad. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great photo. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. All these pictures are pictures I've taken. Um, so I tried to as we go through, I labeled each, each of them, but, um, so just so you guys like could see kind of, this is like a true picture from someone who's there. It's not like a Googled photo. Um, yeah, paradise is amazing. Um, I am so glad you got to go there. It's, um, the highest entrance to the park in terms of elevation. It actually is the highest highway in Washington. Um, so why I say that is if you want good views just straight from the parking lot, this is the place to go. Um, for any folks with like accessibility issues, um, part of the pathways here are paved and so they're more like wheelchair accessible. And then also I love my parents, but they're not the most athletic folks. And so it was really nice to be able to take them to a place where um, they could have beautiful views and also get, you know, hikes in, but just the whole time it's stunning. Um, the other thing, oops, sorry. Um, the other thing to note is it can get a little crowded in the summer. Um, and that's just something to be aware of. Like I said, um, this is a photo from Skyline Loop Trail, which is my favorite, um, hike from this entrance. And this is in July. And this is, um, there are like, there's quite famous, it's called bear grass, but those like puffy, like Dr. Seuss like plants. Um, so Yeah. My, um, if you are going to go and you want to get in, um, I think a pretty reasonable hike, I would recommend Skyline Loop Trail. It's five and a half miles and it's only 1400 feet of gain basically. And I'm sure you guys are probably all quite familiar, but sometimes that's not really the miles. It's more the gain that can do you in. So 1450 is like very reasonable, but I think, um, pretty doable. This is like a couple hour hike. Um, so this is photos from that trail. This um, on the left, it's called Myrtle Falls. It's just like a teeny tiny offshoot. And then from the right, this photo is closer up towards Panorama Point, which is like kind of the high peak of the hike. 
Um, so we'll talk about timing at the end, but timing really matters. I think something that sometimes people forget is that um, these are definitely real mountains, definitely have real snow. So these are the same, this is from the same location as these photos. Um, so this is from Paradise and I went in May last summer or last spring and um, there's snow down to the parking lot. So if you are interested in going to Mount Rainier, I would definitely say if you want a relatively snow-free experience, the earliest you can really go is um, is July. And that's just something to be aware of. I think sometimes we underestimate how long the snow persists. Um, I put this little map in. These are really easy to find on Google, but um, just to highlight, here's the entrance paradise. And then as you can see, there's like a ton of good accessible trails um, just from paradise itself. The one that I would highlight as being like a 5.5 miler is the skyline trail that's this loop. And it kind of goes up north, really quite close to the mountain. Um, and then loops around down um, back below and there's Myrtle Falls. Um, another good hike I've heard about is Reflection Lake, which is down here a little bit more to the south. I've tried to do it, but I went too early in the season and it was too covered in snow. Um, but I've heard that one's also a pretty reasonable loop, very, very dual, comfortable um, with really wonderful views. Um, I wanted to jump onto the sunrise entrance. Um, this is like I mentioned, this one's kind of the northeast corner of the of the national park. Um, it's the other one with a like solid visitor center lodge type of thing. Um, I absolutely love this um, entrance as well. There's so many good hikes from here. Um, so a couple that I that are like really my favorite would be Burroughs Mountain, Fremont Lookout, and then Summerland hike. Um, the Fremont Lookout, just to note, there's like four um, fire towers in the park. So Fremont is one of them. Tuolumne is one of them, which I'll talk about in a minute. There's another one called um, Shriners Peak that has a lookout. And there's a last one called Gobbler's Knob, which is actually pretty um, hard to access at the moment because the, the road to that trailhead is washed out, but there's four fire lookouts in the park, which I think are particularly fun and interesting because um, there's a little bit of a, like a historical element. And then also they have like amazing views. <laughs> um, so this is, these are all pictures that I took um, from Summerland. It is of the three, so Burroughs, um, Fremont, and then Summerland. This is the longest one. It's a 12 miler um, and it's 29, 50 in terms of gain. So it's a pretty, I would put it at like a very reasonable day, like a full day kind of hike. Um, I think it's beautiful because you get so much variety of terrain. So you start out in the, actually in the forest, kind of below the tree line, and then you work your way up to the meadows, which are these like beautiful alpine meadows. And then you kind of come to the peak, um, at close to this place called Panhandle Gap. Um, and it has these like insane sort of granite basins which are just like insanely beautiful very serene and um pretty otherworldly it just feels like you're in a different planet um so it's a like 10 out of 10 could not recommend this hike further especially if you really want like a full day full kind of variety of terrain experience um one thing to note is there are bears in all of the places I'm talking about. Um, but I did in fact see a bear on this very hike when I did it. So bear awareness is always important. Um, but just so you know, there are bears and I did see one on this hike. I just didn't get a photo of it. Um, so this is one of my favorites from that entrance. Um, and then two more that are just completely stellar are Burroughs Trail and Fremont Lookout. Um, these aren't quite as long. They're not really, I mean, they're still full days, like when you drive down there and wait in line and all that stuff. But um, they're not as, they're not quite as epic or in terms of the distance as the other two. So they're a little bit more doable if you're not looking for a super, super long day. Um, so burrows, they're, they're called burrows. I guess burrow just means little hill or something like that because they're numbered. So there's first, second, and third. Um, the nice thing is you can always go up to one of the burrows and then come back down. So you can go up to first burrows and then come back down or go up to second burrows and then come back down. They're kind of like sequential. In total, if you do all three burrows, they're nine miles and 25, um, hundred feet of gain. 
Um, and they get you really quite close to the mountain. So this is from, uh, I think this isn't even the last burrow. You can kind of see the burrow in the distance. Um, but this, like, basically as you're going up the burrows, you're getting closer and closer to the mountain. So that's really cool. Um, and then Fremont Lookout just has, like, stellar views throughout the whole hike. Um, and you end up at this, like, fire tower, which is a great lunch spot. And you get these like insanely beautiful views of the mountain because you're kind of up even higher than you would be because you can get up into the fire tower. Um, I think I can't quite remember if you can even go inside or not, but you can definitely go onto the tower itself, which is wonderful. Um, and then I'll talk about the last entrance. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot I included this map. So here's a map of the sunrise entrance. This is kind of the main um, like where they have the bathrooms and the cafe and the visitor center. Um, and you can see that the Fremont Trail, it's all kind of, um, there's a lot of interconnecting trails kind of here at the base. Um, and then you, so you can work your way out kind of like this way or this way, but you pass by Frozen Lake, which is this like very beautiful little blue lake. And then you go, go up to the fire, uh, Mount Fremont lookout here. If you do the burrows, you kind of loop out here. So you have first burrows, second burrows, and then they don't really have it labeled, but I think their third burrows is like basically right here. So you can do it as a loop or you can do it as an out and back. Um, something to note is that the entrance or the trailhead to the Summerland Trail is actually lower. It's down here. It's not actually at... Um, the it's not actually at the sunrise entrance so you don't have to do the full drive up to the visitor center to get on to the summerland trail but you do still enter the park so like the park entrance is kind of down this way so you do still have to wait in the long line to get into the park but you don't actually go all the way to the visitor center um something to highlight particularly for Ranjini um is that there's this amazing trail called the Wonderland Trail. It goes circumferentially around the whole mountain. And a lot of the hikes kind of bump onto it for a little bit and then come back off of it. But it's essentially, it's a, I think it's about 200 miles and it's like a seven to 10 day backpacking trip. Um, I haven't done it myself. I've been trying to get permits for like three years now, but one day hopefully I'll do it. Um, and it's a great, I think it would be like an amazing multi-day backpacking trip. Um, I will talk about the last entrance and then I'll just pause and see if anyone has any questions about Rainier. Um, so the last entrance is um, the Moich Lake slash Carbon River entrance. This is my personal favorite. Um, it's the most kind of off the beaten path. It usually has the least number of people. And then it's also the closest entrance to Seattle. So I think those are kind of all perks. Um, the only caveat is that historically it has had a very bad road um, with like a lot of potholes, et cetera. So just be aware if you do end up going there, I would probably recommend a vehicle with like pretty good ground clearance and or four wheel drive. Um, the other two entrances are completely paved all the way up. And so you don't have to worry about your vehicle um, as long as the road is open. This is the one road that can be a little bit tricky. So those are, that's like a bit of a caveat. Um, there's two hikes that I absolutely love that I would recommend. One is Tuolumne and the other is Spray Park. So this photo is of Spray Park. Um, and Spray Park is an eight miler, 1700 foot gain hike. Um, it is very magical because you spend a lot of time up in these like alpine meadows which I think are just so beautiful um and you get wonderful views of Rainier um Tuolumne Lookout is another just amazing hike as they all are but it has um it's the second of the four fire lookouts that I mentioned and so you go and you can park um basically at the same parking lot that you would for Spray Park um but you kind of are actually moving a little bit more north so you're moving farther away from the mountain you pass by this lake and then you go up um, up a hill where the fire lookout is and you get like a, a wonderful view where you're kind of looking down and then up at Rainier. This one's also a little shorter, I think um, a little bit less um, strenuous option. So 5.8 miles, 1100 feet of game. All right, those are the highlights of Rainier. Um, 
any thoughts or comments or questions that people have? No. No. Um, Maria, are any of these ones that you've done? Yeah, so I summited Rainier last year. Oh, congrats. So, That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. And then, but I have done, um, oh my gosh, it was the, the Fremont. And that was probably one of my favorite hikes there too. So um, I was really, like I, I went when there were like all the flowers were out and it was really beautiful. But I haven't um, got done Tell Me uh, peak or spray park so I will probably hit those up those this summer yeah <laughs> those are closer. yeah they're closer yeah um, they still can get a little bit busy I would say but they're not nearly like the level of crowds as the other entrances which is really nice awesome. um yeah thank you for sharing I the only other thing I just wanted to mention is there's not a lot of lodging options necessarily within the park I think at the two um, visitor centers there are um, but those get, I'm pretty sure, booked out really far in advance. However, there are a lot of little towns quite close to the entrances. So Ashford, Packwood, um, and Enumclaw are kind of the, I, I don't want to call them big cities, but those are cities, towns, I guess, with options for housing or lodging um, closer by if you wanted to stay for like a night or a couple of days. All right. Okay. Um, I will scoot us along. I also recognize I budgeted half an hour and we're at half an hour and we've only talked about one of the parks. So um, please feel free if you have things to go. Um, I absolutely understand popping offline. If you want the slides, just you can send me your email address in the chat and I will be happy to email you the slides if you have to go or just want to copy for any reason. Um, so next up are the Olympics. So just to remind us, these are this is out on the peninsula. This is about a three or four hour drive from Seattle, or um, it's still about three or four hours if you add in the ferry time. Um, but there is a ferry ver uh, version that you can take um, kind of from Seattle out to the peninsula. You can go to Bainbridge Island is um, one way to do it, which is a ferry. And then to get, once you're on Bainbridge Island, you can just take the... Um, you can take a bridge. So it's only one ferry once you get to Bainbridge and then you can take um, a, a bridge to get out to the peninsula. So just that is just an important sort of travel awareness. I was having a hard time remembering the word bridge. <laughs> okay, so why go to the Olympics? Um, great question. The Olympics are amazing. Um, I think the key features of the Olympics that makes them really appealing are they have an, a complete variety of trains. So Stephen mentioned going to the rainforest, also going to the mountains. If you want to see it all, the Olympics have it all. So you have ocean, rainforest, mountains. Um, I think it's really hard to get kind of all of those types of terrain in one trip or even in one park and the Olympics have that so that's extremely cool um the other thing that makes it nice is that a lot of this stuff is lower level elevation um so what that means is whereas Rainier and the Cascades are very snow dependent and you have to wait for the snow to melt the Olympics are actually I would say largely accessible year round. Um, and that's pretty appealing too. So it's not such a limited um, window of when you can visit. Um, the, key, the thing that's really important is I don't think it's necessarily obvious when you're just looking at a map um, until you really take a bit of a closer look. But this whole swath of the Olympics is actually very inaccessible by road. So the, ro the main road that you get to access the Olympics like goes all the way circumferentially around the Olympics. There are some like offshoots um, that go into the park, some of which are paved and most of which are kind of unpaved dirt roads. And then truly the heart of the park, like the real center of the park is not accessible by road. It's only accessible by hiking or backpacking, um, which I think is really cool. So I wanted to highlight um, 
a really phenomenal, just, I would put it on the scale of two to three night backpacking trip. Um, Maria, I'm going to put in a plug for this. If you're going to get, I don't, you're, you're going to get my plug for this. Um, as someone who lives out here and may or may not have been, I'm not sure, but it's, um, just amazing because it's like essentially a very chill backpack, which means to me, it's like three miles to get from the car to the coast. And it's essentially flat. There's a very low, there's a very short, um, section right by the coast where you go down um I don't want to say a cliff but it's like a, you go down to the coast and but that's really the only gain and so it's like very 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 user-friendly in the sense that if you want to have a luxurious camping slash glamping experience this is the place to go um because I think that three mile hike in kind of it's really not very um overwhelmed by people it's pretty underwhelmed by people it's pretty like um private feeling and then but you have like uh, the ability to carry in some of the more luxurious items like camping chairs or things like that that you might not want to carry if it's like a 10 mile um hike so i think this is absolutely beautiful um you can camp basically anywhere on the beach and then you can walk up and down the beach and um just there's like these amazing tidal pools. There are um, starfish, the sea anemones, things like that just throughout, um, which makes it really beautiful. The one thing I wanted to point out is that Shai Shai Beach in particular is um, an interesting place in that it's both in the national park and also on reservation land. And so you have to do a little um, permit investigation and you actually have to have two permits to um, backpack there. So one is from the national park, which you can pick up at the national park um, ranger office, which is in Port Angeles, which is on your way. Um, the drive is on your way. And then you also have to get a, um, a reservation from the tribe that it's on. And that is also on your way. You just kind of have to time it and make sure you stop at both places and get both permits. Um, other options of places to go on the coast that I haven't been to, or I might've been to, but I haven't done as a backpacking trip would be like first, second or third beach. Um, they're a little bit farther South on the coast. Shai Shai is like basically kind of right on the North side. Um, if I go back, I'll pinpoint it out to you guys, but, um, oops. Yeah, so Shai Shai is kind of like over in this area, and then some of the other ones are down a little bit um, closer to Forks, um, and those are, I've heard, wonderful as well. Um, so that's Shai Shai Beach. Um, I think the mountains of the Olympics are kind of undersold and I think are absolutely stellar and beautiful as well. So one of those is, um, oh, same day permit question. Maria, you can get them on the same day. Um, I... In advance, I would imagine maybe rec.gov would have some backpacking permits for the Olympics in advance, but I got them both on the day of, and you can, um, and I didn't have any problem with that. I would probably just try to get to the, um, to the park ranger office, like right when it opens. Um, but yeah, I got them day of and it was fine. Um, so the, so the Olympic mountains, um, so I love Mount Eleanor, Mount Townsend, Marmot Pass, Royal Basin, and then those are, um, those are all kind of off of, I'll go back just a bit here. Those are all like on the Eastern side of the park. Um, so they're all pretty doable as day hikes from Seattle, um, and then the last, but certainly not least, is Hurricane Ridge. That is where the visitor center is, um, and it's right south of Port Angeles. So Port Angeles is like up in here, and then Hurricane Ridge is right here. Um, and it has a paved road up to the up to the um, visitor center, and very accessible. And then it has like absolutely beautiful um, views just from the parking lot itself. So have to make sure I mention and highlight Hurricane Ridge. Um, this photo is from Royal Basin. Oh, Stephen says we did Hurricane Ridge, a great hike. Yes, I completely agree. I think if you can really only do one hike in the Olympics, I would probably have to say it's Hurricane Ridge. Um, this one I highlight as kind of a little bit more, it's I'm not going to say off the beaten path because I think it's pretty well known, but um, I would just say that it's maybe not quite as um, visited as like the 
visitor center itself. And so it's not quite as crowded, but it has these amazing views. So this is Mount Eleanor. Um, it is a 6.2 miler that's 3,300 feet of gain. Um, and when you get to the top, you get both views of kind of the eastern side where you can see all the channels and the sound, which is what we're looking, we're looking at kind of like the rivers and sound here. Um, and then once you actually get to the summit, then you get the rest of the Olympic range on the other side. And you can actually see all the way to like um, the San Juan Islands and even up into Canada. So you get these like um, incredible 360 degree views. Um, at the time that I did this, there were mountain goats, um, which was pretty fun to see. They actually have done like a mountain goat extraction program where they're trying to return the mountain goats to where they're actually from. Um, so I don't think there are supposed to be goats there anymore. I think they've moved them all back to the Cascades, which is like more of their natural habitat. But at the time that I did it, there were goats and that was really cool. Um, let me see. Do, do, do. Oh yeah. I think that's all that I have on the Olympics. Um, not to put any pressure on Michelle, but as someone I know who has been to the Olympics, is there anything you want to add? I think I didn't exactly talk about Lake Quinault, which is down here kind of on the South side, which has like beautiful lake, um, lake hikes. I also didn't really mention Crescent Lake, which is also on the North side. Those are great places to stay if you want to do um, sort of like hikes right around lakes. Um, so those are two kind of other areas just to highlight. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think I had too much to to add. I know you have rainforests on there, but there's yeah, the whole rainforest too, um, which I actually have not spent a lot of time in, um, but would definitely want to go uh, and explore there more, but I know that's another big um, highlight uh, in the Olympic uh, National Park. Yeah, I'm wondering if Stephen might have gone there. Yeah, we did. Um, <laughs> we uh, we did Hurricane Ridge came around and um, parked parked there at the visitor center and and did the, the rainforest hike. Of course, we were there in October and there were only maybe twenty other people there. So we really had the hike to ourselves. Uh, I, what impressed me being from the flatlands of Ohio at 680 feet um, when we got to Hurricane was how long it took us to get back to Hurricane, or not Hurricane, get back to the rainforest. That, that was a really, I don't know, it was 11 or 13 mile drive back uh, through the forest. And it really gave you a sense because we kind of did, a, we basically were going around the perimeter. And by going back to the rainforest, we really got a sense of what the park was like. Um, and that was probably the biggest surprise, not to mention the elk who decided to hang out in front of our car. So we we did the, you just eat that grass and we'll wait till you're done before we leave. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think, um, Stephen, you're totally right. So up here is like Hurricane Ridge and then all the way around, you have to go all the way around. And then over in here is where the whole rainforest is. And you definitely are driving like actually pretty deep into the park to um, get to the hurricane like trail access area. Um, so that's awesome. Yeah, I think you definitely get like an insider. You really are entering the park like it's very remote. There's not, I mean, there are visitors, but it's really not like people, a lot of people living out there or anything like that. So it's definitely get like awesome wildlife. Um, I will say for the Ho Rainforest, it is, um, I know if you go to kind of like the main, this main area right here, which is the most sort of famous part, it's pretty flat, which is kind of nice. So if you are feeling like I need a little bit of variety, not just going up mountains all of the time, I think the Ho Rainforest offers a, an opportunity for a little bit more of a low level um, hike. All right. So that brings us to our last, um, our last national park. And I will be honest, it's my favorite. Um, I will I will ask before we go further, Maria, have you spent much time in the North Cascades? I, not as much as I would like. Um, I've done like Maple Pass Loop a couple of times. And the first time that I did it, there was barely any people. And the second time I think Instagram caught up to it and it was packed. So it was like 
a different experience, um, but we did another one that was really nice, but I can't remember the name of it, but it's pretty far. So it's like, it's usually we have to plan it out, but I love the North Cascades. Yeah. Awesome. I'm glad you've gotten to go up there. Um, I think you definitely are right. It's kind of the farthest from Seattle and um, you have to really devote like a full day or a couple of days to get up there. So it's three or four hour drive. Um, it is um, kind of centered on Highway 20. So I'm zooming in here, but essentially you Highway 20 kind of travels from west to east and it goes from concrete here on the west through New, New Halem in the middle and then on the east over towards Mazama um, and you pass through Rainy Pass. So I... Um, I cannot emphasize enough how amazing I think the North Cascades are. I think they're kind of underappreciated. I think they're like one of the least visited national parks in the United States, which is crazy to me um, because I think they're just incredibly beautiful. Um, I think the caveat is that the the time window of when you can go to this park is really limited. So it's, I would say July through October is really kind of like maximum and that's because it's very very snowy and specifically highway 20 actually closes in the winter um because it's too much of an avalanche risk so the highway itself gets avalanches quite frequently and so it's closed from like october until may i think um so i think that's just a pretty notable caveat is the the window of the season for this park is really quite limited um a couple other things to note is there's this road called Cascade River Road. It kind of departs Marble Mount is, is important to know because that's where the National Park Office is if you want to get permits for anything. Um, and you drive, so you either go to Marble Mount and then up um, towards New Halem off of Highway 20, or you go from Marble Mount out to Cascade River Road. Um, and I think Cascade River Road has a lot of pretty amazing hikes off of it. Um, that is actually not where Maple Pass is. Maple Pass is off of Highway 20. Um, but this is like, if, if you have not yet been to this area, this is probably one of the most beautiful places in Washington. Um, otherwise, the other thing to note is larches are a big thing here. They're like our special tree, evergreen tree that turns golden. Um, it's not really evergreen, I guess, but they, there's like larch mayhem in the fall when the trees are turning colors. And it's also because they're only in a specific elevation zone. Um, so I would absolutely recommend going to this, to like any of these places in the fall, um, if you really want to get some good large views in. So a um, couple recommended Highway 20 hikes. Um, so Easy Pass is here on the left. It's a seven mile, 2,800 foot gain hike. Um, it has like, you go up to a pass and then you get like, th you know, 360 views of the mountains. I picked this photo just because it highlights the lurches. Um, a similar sort of like distance elevation hike is Cutthroat Pass. It's also very beautiful. Um, and then Blue Lake, I put here, it's on the right. It's a, it's a much, um, I, I want to say easier option. So it's 4.4 miles, 1100 feet gain. So if you have visitors or you are um, trying to get a little bit more of an easier version of a hike, um, Blue Lake is stunning and you come up to this like pristine lake. Um, so if you're out there for a couple of days and you're looking for an easier afternoon or something like that, Blue Lake is a good one. And then Maria already talked about Maple Pass Loop, it is amazing and um, very well known and very popular um, where you get kind of these <clears throat> good views of Lake Anne and I would pick a weekday or something like that to do Maple Pass. Um, this, I wanted to highlight some hikes off of Cascade River Road. Um, so I call that Cascade Pass, but that's what I showed you here, kind of this more Southern branch. Um, I perhaps think this is the place to go if you only have a day to go. Um, so Sahale Glacier hike, you go to Cascade um, Pass and then up to Sahale Glacier. This is the where this photo is taken from. So you can see kind of the arm, you climb up this, this arm here. Um, and you end up looking down. This has a this has a very interesting name. I forgot what it is, but it has a cool name. This um 
it's like like forgotten or something like that um and then you look out and um see all of the rest of the cascades um Michelle says Sahali is great for backpacking just be aware of the weather she got stuck in a snowstorm there in late July um yeah thanks for mentioning that so for anyone who wants like I would say a one or two night overnight you can get um backcountry permits at the ranger station in Marble Mount and then you can go up and um you can go up and camp up at the glacier um there are these like rocky sort of like I don't want to say outcroppings but they've basically people have like stacked rocks to kind of give you a little bit of a protected area for camping um I almost did this last summer as well Michelle and we were too afraid of the weather it was like July or August but the um the sites are at 9,000 feet and the temperature was supposed to get down to the 20s so, um, yes, we did get same day permits to do this. Um, it was a weekday, but we just went to the marble. We got to the marble Mount Ranger station, like half an hour before it opened and we got same day permits. Um, the weather ended up just being a little bit more dramatic than we were looking for. Um, and so we decided not to actually stay up there, but you can definitely do it, um, as same day permits and it is beautiful. I would just really be dialed into your, um, your gear and I would just make sure you have like adequate um provisions for pretty cold camping because um I think it was supposed to get into the 20s and that's I would think pretty standard for like July yeah okay so that is the Holly Glacier um the last one is Hidden Lakes Lookout um this is interesting in that it's kind of right on the um right on the border of the national park so part of the hike is not within the national park and part of it is um so you kind of do this beautiful approach where you're going up and through this ravine you see a lot of wildflowers and then you go through kind of a rocky section and then at the top you look down and you see this like beautiful um stunning little lake um there is a lookout up here and you can actually camp in the lookout um it's same day like it's sort of first come first serve and there's actually no permits for this so if you wanted to do an overnight backpacking trip where you just go and stay in the lookout you could um as long as you're there on the early side because it, it's sort of like it's a pretty popular spot and um whoever gets to the to the lookout first and sort of sets up their stuff gets to stay in it um so i'd bring a tent just in case you don't get to stay in it um I will say, like I mentioned before, I saw bears here in this very ravine. So this is also a very bear friendly territory. Um, so they are there. Uh, and yeah. Um, let's see if I did I have anything else for this. Oh, yeah. So it's eight miles, 3,300 feet of gain. Um, so those were my highlights. Um, I just wanted to talk really briefly about sort of like things to know just because um, I feel like sometimes you can forget these things and they're pretty important. Um, so we talked about this before, timing is key. The Olympics are the best time to, are the best one to visit year round. Um, there's more lower, sorry, lower elevation um, terrain and then there's more of a variety of activities. Um, Mount Rainier is open throughout the year. Right now, it's only open on the weekends um, for the winter season. We're still in the winter season, um, but the snow really doesn't melt until early July. So I feel like I've learned this the hard way on in multiple years, like June, it's going to be snowy. Um, so I would say best time to visit is really July through September. North Cascades we talked about is probably the hardest in terms of snow access. The Highway 20 is totally closed in the winter. Um, so I would say the best time to visit is also kind of July through September. Um, so if you have an America the Beautiful Pass, that will get you an entrance to all. It's either $50 or $80 for a year-round pass, so it's a pretty good deal. Um, if you want to do any hiking in Washington, I cannot advocate strongly enough for this Um a website called WTA. It's um, that stands for Washington Trails Association. So WTA.org. Um, the value of this site, as opposed to like all trails or things like that, is everyone in Washington, that's the site they use for hikes. Um, it They'll post a description of the trail. They'll post um, elevation and uh, length of the trail. They'll post directions. They post um, 
like a GPS linked maps. You can actually see where the hike is. And then probably the most valuable thing is it's really updated frequently with trip reports. And so people will say like still snow covered or bugs are a problem or we saw a bear or things like that. Um, so it's really, and road conditions, things like that. So I always, anytime I'm going out, I checked up UTA and I look specifically at the trip reports. Um, a couple last things to note. Number one, we are starting to get really consistent wildfires. Um, and so just note that um, in early September, if you plan a trip, you may get smoke. Um, it's kind of variable, like September, October, even August sometimes can have smoke. Um, but just if you have asthma and or don't want to be out in wildfires, um, just to keep an eye on that. Um, and then the last thing I mentioned is I, like I said, everywhere that I talked about is bear territory. Um, specifically bat black bears, we don't have grizzlies here. Um, so I, I think I'm not really concerned about like safety. I, I mean, I am concerned about safety, but I think it's really more just making sure you're following leave no trace principles. So making sure you pack everything in and out, um, not leaving, leaving anything with scent um, on you. If you go backpacking, making sure you're doing like proper food storage. Um, if you're backpacking, um, I think our interaction with bears here in Washington is a lot better than it is in some other places like Yosemite and California, for example, where they have really bad bear problems. Um, here, I think bears generally will leave you alone, but that's because people follow leave no trace. And so I can just say, like, I think that's pretty important. Um, well, thanks you guys for listening. Sorry, it took more than half an hour. I just didn't really know how long it would take. Um, I will open the floor for questions. I am doing this. I am not paid. I'm just a person, um, but I am raising funds for a bike ride for climate justice. Um, Ranjani is also doing this with me, so I'm really excited to do it. It's this month, and we all, um, all of the fundraising that I'm doing is for Eco.Logic. It's a nonprofit organization focused on environmental education. Um, so anything that you donated just when you registered for the event, I'm going to send it straight to there. And if you um, are interested in sending me any funds via Venmo, I put my name and my phone number just in case they need that. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm trying to raise $500, which is a pretty big endeavor. And so anything, five, ten dollars $10, anything would be great. Um, with that being said, anyone have any questions? Whoops. Emily, a great report. I'm happy to report that I hit uh, two of, the, of your <laughs> awesome. two of hike, our hikes. Yeah. Hit your, hit your most popular list. So great. That's awesome. Um, do we get any, Maria, did you get any gems like for you in the summer? Yes, so I have a couple, um, definitely one to do the, the Sahali Glacier, it looks so beautiful, so, yeah. um, and then see if I can get, like, make myself over to Shai Shai, is it Shai Shai? Yeah, Shai Shai, awesome, yeah. yeah, that sounds great, I, um, I did Shai Shai actually on the 4th of July a couple of years ago, and it was so fun because, um, I was only there for like one or two nights, but someone, a big group that went, they brought like light up bocce ball and it just was like a really fun scene. Um, it wasn't, it really wasn't like overwhelmingly crowded, but it's just, like I said, you, it's pretty like, I don't want to say easy, but it's so, it's so approachable that you can bring in like good food. And it just is like a really nice overnight. Um, the, the, Getting out there though does take some time. So I would probably try to give yourself like three days in total. So you don't just like drive out, spend many hours driving and then drive back. Um, and then Sahali Glacier, I think is probably the most beautiful place I've been in Washington. I just went last summer for the first time and I was like, how come I've lived here for seven years and I haven't been yet. So I definitely think it's really, really worthwhile. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, on your bed more I'm trying to uh, make sure that I have the right person. Yeah. Are you wearing like a gray cardigan? Um, let me double check because I don't want to give you the wrong person. <laughs> I could be. Let's see. I am not. I okay. um. My so, let's see. Did you do Emily Grossnikaus? 
Yeah. And huh. there's another one. So Oh, I'm um, wearing blue. It's a blue background and I'm wearing a blue shirt. Man. Um let me see. Oh wait, I think I see you. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I see you. Blue shirt, glasses. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I didn't know there was another Emily Gross class in the world. I'm curious who this person is. <laughs> Um, thanks you guys again so much. It was really fun to talk to you guys and also review all the beautiful places in Washington. So um, I, I have this slide up in case you need my email. Um, but yeah, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. This was so, so amazing. And thank you for sharing your wisdom. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, have thanks. a good one. Happy. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> Bye. Bye.